Hello, good morning. Welcome to this eighth day of the conversation on the proportionality test. Today is the last day of sessions. We are very pleased to have you during these long days and also fruitful days. And what a better way to close with Dr. Matthias Kums's presentation. As you know, he is one of the most authorized voices with respect to proportionality test and all the matters, the issues and advantages related to it. I remind you, if you are in our social media and in the Moodle platform that you can send us your questions via the tools of these platforms. Professor Matthias Kum is professor of the School of Law of the University of New York, NYU, and today he will talk about proportionality and for political pathologies. Professor Kum, thank you very much for being with us today, and you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. The topic of my talk is proportionality and for political pathologies. Um, and I want to do uh, two things. First, I want to provide some ger general characteristics uh, of the proportionality uh, test, which are supposed to illustrate its distinctive general moral point. Uh, and then secondly, I will go into the discussion of four uh, political uh, pathologies and how the proportionality test is an instrument to address them. So first to the general characterization. Now, everyone here is likely to be familiar with the various prongs of the proportionality test, its formal structure. In its most widely known form, notwithstanding subtle variations that exist, across jurisdictions. In its basic form, uh, it consists of uh, four questions uh, that um, judges are asked to, uh, that judges ask. First, they ask whether there's a legitimate purpose for any measure that infringes on a right, legitimate purpose. Secondly, they ask whether a measure is necessary in the sense that it's the least restrictive means of equally effective uh, measures. And third, um, they then ask uh, whether on balance, um, the infringement uh, of the right uh, is in fact outweighed uh, by considerations relating to furthering legitimate purpose. So that much you, is familiar, you all know that. Um, uh, what I uh, wanted to do is now ask, what is the distinctive feature of such a test. Now, to begin with, it should be acknowledged that this is not an, uh, a technical, narrow, legalistic test in any sense. Um, when we ask these questions, when judges ask these questions, uh, what they are in fact trying to find out is whether or not there is a good rational justification for what public authorities are in fact doing. So um, each of these prongs of the test asks a question uh, and, and each of these questions is a necessary question you need to have an answer to in order for the measure to be rationally justified. So a measure is not rationally justifiable if it doesn't have a legitimate, if it doesn't further a legitimate purpose. Uh, it's not really, it's not justified if it's not legitimate, if it's not necessary in the sense that there is a more restrictive means available that furthers the legitimate purpose to the same extent. It is not um, a rational measure if on balance it's disproportionate. So um, the Proportionality test is little more uh, than a set of, cry of individually necessary and collectively sufficient conditions for 
measures by public authorities to be justifiable rationally. So it's a rationality test. It ultimately tells us whether there's a rational justification for acts of public authority. So that's a distinctive feature. That's one a characteristic of the test that needs to be understood. Note how the proportionality test, even though it is not legalistic, it's not something you can, um, uh, it's, it's not uh, an authoritative decision uh, that is then implemented through logical deductive uh, types of legal reasoning that judges normally engage in. But at the same time, uh, it is also not uh, something that requires judges to necessarily engage in sophisticated philosophical reasoning. So think about Ronald Dworkin, um, uh, the American uh, legal philosopher who claimed that when judges adjudicate rights, they have to imagine themselves as a quasi Herculean figure, a demigod like figure, having to engage in complicated theoretical and philosophical um, issues. And even though there is something, I think, that Dworkin captures about the task of adjudication, he misses um, how at least within, uh, when rights analysis is conducted within a proportionality framework, how much of what judges do is quite basic and pedestrian. They ask what justification does the government have? Does, does the government have? And does the justification that the government provide meet the relevant prongs of the proportionality test? So in that sense, judges don't are re not really engaged in an interpretation of the law. And says, instead, they primarily assess justifications underlying um, what legislatures or the executive uh, has done and to see whether uh, what they have done uh, is a justified restriction uh, on uh, a right. Okay, uh, so those are some general characteristics um, about uh, how I think we should think uh, about proportionality. Um, now, what is the point exactly? And what is, what is, what is the problem that such a test um, seeks to address? Uh, so what kind of violations of human rights um, uh, does it, is it effective in addressing? Now, we might, of course, simply say um, uh, anything that doesn't meet the proportionality requirement and does which as a requirement is anything that doesn't meet the proportionality requirement is a violation um, in, uh, of human rights. Um, and therefore all this test does is to secure human rights. And on a very general abstraction, that's uh, level of abstraction, that's true. But there's something more specific, I think uh, we can uh, learn about how proportionality functions when we think about the type of political pathologies um, that we are likely to encounter uh, on occasion uh, in the democratic process. So my claim is not that the democratic process always exhibits these pathologies. Uh, of course it doesn't, but um, I think the four pathologies that I will be addressing, even though the list could probably be extended, are pathologies that we can see um, happening um, uh, on occasion, again and again, um, and not just in one jurisdiction, not just in one state, but uh, across um, uh, all jurisdictions. So let me begin and point to the first pathology. And this is a pathology uh, that comes up um, most often, not necessarily only but in, but most often uh, in the context of issues that can be described as cultural issues. So think about questions uh, relating, for example, um, 
uh, to uh, gay marriage, just as an example. The problem with the idea uh, of gay marriage uh, originally was um, that it didn't seem to be compatible with well-established traditions, with well-established understandings, conventions um, about uh, what marriage has been traditionally understood to be. And as is very often the case, uh, these traditions and conventions um, uh, are supported um, by ongoing uh, preferences um, that um, a significant part of the population may have in that regard. But here's the core point uh, um, of, um, of rights. The fact that there is uh, a preference, even of the majority of a certain kind, the fact that there is a tradition or a convention to do something one way rather than another is in and of itself not a reason justifying an infringement of rights. So the first prong of the proportionality test, which requires public authorities to give a legitimate purpose, uh, to articulate a legitimate policy goal, um, is in a very important part of the proportionality test because of what it rules out. And one of the things it rules out is arguments, if you want to call them that, um, that merely invoke um, traditions, conventions, preferences. The fact that we've done something in a certain way for a long time, that in our community, this is what it means to do something, or that in this community, the majority has preferences of a certain kind is in and of itself insufficient to justify an infringement uh, of a right. Any infringement of the right has to be justified with reference to furthering a legitimate purpose. And it is not a legitimate purpose uh, to simply invoke facts about what is accepted, what has been done, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, even though it is rarely the case that a measure fails uh, conclusively because there is no legitimate purpose that government can invoke, it is important um, to note that these types of reasons um, tradition, convention, preference, are excluded uh, as reasons that of themselves are legitimate purposes and that of themselves have any significant weight. And the first prong of the proportionality test, which requires public authorities to mention some kind of legitimate purpose, for example, relating to public health, public security, uh, what have you, uh, helps to focus the whole discussion on legitimate purposes and away from social facts about conventions, traditions, preferences. So that's, that's an important point, um, with, uh, th an important issue addressed by the first prong of the proportionality test. But the first prong of the proportionality test is also a central instrument to address a second pathology. And the second uh, pathology concerns the limits of the kinds of purposes that count as legitimate purposes in liberal constitutional democracies. More specifically, in liberal de constitutional democracies, it is not a legitimate purpose to enact uh, what you might call morality legislation. That means to enact as binding on everyone, norms that concern issues, how somebody should ultimately live their lives and what kind of good it should direct it towards. Also questions of religion and the right faith. So here the core idea is that it is not a legitimate purpose uh, to make individuals um, virtuous human beings in an existential kind of way. 
how they seek to become happy or good human beings is to be left to individuals uh, for themselves to decide. This is a core issue relating to often framed as privacy issue and sometimes just framed as an aspect of a general right to liberty. But the point is with regard to the proportionality test and the first prong when we ask what is a legitimate purpose, what is excluded uh, here is an invocation of any kind of a perfectionist idea uh, of how human beings should live their lives um, uh, and what makes their lives meaningful, etc. So, um, um, arguments, uh, for example, um, if we take up the, the example of gay marriage again, it's not just that arguments about this is not how we've done this, this is not what, how we understand it, this is not what we prefer, so tradition, convention, preference are off the table, They're not, they don't count. And what also doesn't count is an argument along the lines that says, um, living in a community as a gay person is inherently morally wrong, or it is something that our religion, which tells us how to live our life, uh, prohibits or, dis or describes as, in some sense, um, a, a deviancy from God's path. Now, we may argue that these are claims that as a matter of religion uh, or as morality are deeply misguided. Uh, I believe they are. But the point about the proportionality test is that these are questions we don't need to address. We don't need to solve questions of the correct interpretation of the theological tradition, what Christianity really requires or what some other religion requires. We don't need to decide um, what, is, what is the right way to think about how individuals, we, how we should live our lives, what it is that we should orient them towards, what it is for them to be virtuous. We don't need to decide that. It's an irrelevant irre consideration. And the first prong of the proportionality test, when we ask for a legitimate purpose, ensures um, uh, that uh, these types of um, uh, questions um, are uh, excluded. So any legitimate purpose will have to be a purpose that is uh, non-perfectionist, uh, non-religious uh, in that sense. So, the, and, and the pathology of political processes is that sometimes um, uh, ideas about individual virtue or of religious, uh, uh, re of what are interpreted to be uh, religious requirements uh, play a central role. That is a pathology that the first prong of the proportionality test uh, can and often does successfully address. A third issue um, that the proportionality test um, can effectively address are uh, overreactions, uh, overreactions um, by the political process, by public authorities, and times uh, of crisis when there is widespread fear. There is a pattern that we can see that whenever there is a crisis, often in, in particular security crisis, but it can also be a public health crisis, like in the pandemic. We see public authorities overreacting, scrambling uh, to be responsive to a fearful electorate. And this kind of, um, uh, the kind of reactions uh, that we often see uh, are, uh, for example, Let's, if we just go back in time a little bit, uh, when the issues of terrorism uh, were foregrounded, particularly in the Western world, in North America and in Europe, following September 11, um, some states were inclined um, to take um, draconian measures, which were claimed uh, to uh, be necessary and uh, adequate uh, to deal with a terrorist threat. Um, they included such things, they could include such things as, for example, uh, a Muslim ban, the ban uh, of Muslims to enter a country, simply because um, those who, the kind of terrorism that the population was afraid of and the public authorities were focused on, 
was connected to Islamic fundamentalism. So if uh, terrorism is connected to, fundamental, uh, to Islamic fundamentalism, and if it is true that Islamic fundamentalism uh, is uh, particularly strong in a wide range of countries uh, that are Muslim majority, uh, then, so the reasoning went, it is better to be safe than sorry to preclude all Muslims uh, from entering uh, the country. Um, so that's one type of reaction we might see. Um, or we might see uh, a reaction, um, uh, the draconian laws can relate to uh, privacy uh, invasions. So there were draconian laws enacted uh, granting public authorities, granting security uh, organs, um, very widespread, very wide and general authorizations to snoop on people, to, um, uh, to collect metadata and analyze their relevant metadata in order uh, to be able to detect uh, dangerous and suspicious uh, patterns of behavior. So the point with regard to these measures is that they clearly further a legitimate purpose. The legitimate purpose is security, um, to guard the population against terrorist threats. So the first prong of the proportionality test uh, is clearly fulfilled. However, what these types of measures um, would, would characterize is then typically uh, is that they are either not necessary uh, or proportionate. They are overreactions. Uh, and the overreactions can be, um, and you can, and they can either take the form uh, that they are not the least restrictive means um, or that they are uh, disproportionate. So with regard to the Muslim ban, uh, for example, you can argue that to address issues of threats uh, of fundamentalist Islam uh, that and terrorism, um, it is not necessary to prohibit any uh, Muslim from entering the country, uh, but only a more restricted class uh, of uh, individuals of whom one uh, has uh, suspicions that they might um, be engaged in terrorism. And even if, if you think that that's not really an equally effective measure, because you lack information, uh, about each individual that might enter the country. At the very least, such a blanket ban is likely to be disproportionate. Uh, so it would fail uh, the balancing test. Um, the same is true with regard to the uh, general uh, universal collection of metadata on the whole population. Uh, even if we were to uh, believe that uh, there is no equally effective uh, means uh, available to furthering the, the legitimate security policies, um, such a measure would arguably uh, be uh, clearly disproportionate uh, because of the, um, of the absence of more specific targeting um, of those measures. So um, the kind of fearful overreaction that we see in situations of crisis uh, are the, uh, among the pathologies uh, that the proportionality test and here the necessary prong and the, proportion, the proportionality in the narrow sense prong, the balancing prong can effectively address. So I come to um, the final prong uh, of uh, the final pathology that I think the proportionality test can address well. And it concerns uh, situations where uh, restrictions are imposed that are claimed to follow a legitimate, uh, further a legitimate purpose, but that in effect um, uh, is enacted uh, for reasons uh, of privileging certain types of powerful economic actors uh, over others. So it's the result of lobbying of interest group policies, pathologies that are the result of um, preferential treatment um, of uh, well-connected, well-financed uh, interest groups. 
that secure privileges uh, through legislation. And to give an example of the type of thing that you might see, um, think about the regulation in many cities or in many communities uh, of uh, the taxi business. Now, in some jurisdictions, and how that is regulated varies greatly uh, from, um, uh, from city to city, from state to state. Um, but in some states, uh, it is the case that before you can offer your services uh, to drive other people around professionally, so as a taxi, um, you have to pass an sometimes quite elaborate test and that test is supposed to, uh, in, in that test, uh, you're supposed to show uh, that you know the locality well, that you are able to find the quickest and best way how to get from A to B in order to be able to serve your clients uh, better. So the idea is there's an information asymmetry uh, somebody wants, you know, somebody lands at an airport. He wants to go to a certain place. He doesn't know how to get there. He, he, that person is likely to depend on the taxi driver to tell him how to get somewhere as quickly as possible. So you want that person to actually be qualified uh, to provide that service, and that's what the te test is supposed to assure. That's the justification of the test, which is a perfectly legitimate purpose uh, under the circumstances, which at least uh, at first sight also doesn't seem to be uh, disproportionate. However, with the emergence um, of uh, GPS uh, widely available and standardly fitted in just about every car and everybody has it in their pocket and their cell phone, uh, that of course uh, has become um, um, uh, a justification which, uh, for reasons of available technology, no longer uh, seems plausible uh, at all. Uh, so uh, having such a test, um, uh, arguably, uh, can no longer be justified uh, as a ground, no longer uh, furthers a legitimate purpose, or at the very least doesn't do so in a way that is not disproportionate. What's really going on in the maintenance of these types of tests, uh, I think, uh, is that very often um, those who are in the taxi business, who are already players in the respective local markets, they want to keep out uh, alternatives. They want to keep out newcomers uh, who may offer their services uh, more cheaply. In particular, of course, um, they may want to keep out Uber, um, which um, uh, uh, operates um, uh, on a different basis and doesn't require these types of uh, tests. But there are some, even today, there are quite a few cities in which Uber can't offer, offer its services because they're prohibited from doing so because uh, the rules relating to the requirements of the taxi business still uh, uh, prevent them from offering their services. And I think that's just, and what's going on there very often is that simply uh, local established businesses that don't want to face new competition uh, want to erect barriers uh, against that competition. These tests, they cost money, they're burdensome. Uh, so it kind of, they're market access measures which prevent um, competition, uh, which under circumstances in which you have GPS uh, uh, they are arguably uh, no longer justified. And there's, that's just one example. We have these types of uh, regulatory measures um, uh, in, in many uh, contexts. Um, so measures uh, which restrict businesses, which restrict professional practices uh, by requiring formal, um, having gone through formal tests and have to provide to have proven certain professional proficiency, um, uh, which actually are not uh, reasonably uh, connected to serious concerns. Um, so uh, these are the types of measures, measures that are ultimately the result of capture um, by well-organized economic actors uh, that a proportionality test can be used to ferret out 
um, to identify and therefore then um, to strike down as unjustifiable. Uh, now note that of course, uh, when judges apply the proportionality test, they do not need to identify uh, any of the particular kind of uh, pathologies that I've just identified. They do not need to say, uh, and they, they generally don't say, here the government is just responsive to fear and is therefore overreacting. Or they don't need to say, this regulation can only be understood as the result of capture by economic groups. Nor do they have to say, the government is just doing this to uphold traditions, um, uh, conventions, uh, and the fact that a majority wants this. Um, so it's a, that would be highly, uh, that would be regarded as an uh, aggressive act against the relevant politicians and judges would uh, presumably not want to say such a thing in their judgments. And of course the proportionality test doesn't require them to say anything like that because all they are doing, all judges are doing is they're assessing justifications of following the various prongs uh, of the proportionality test. Um, and all they are saying in the end, if they strike down a measure on the grounds that it violates the proportionality test, they are saying that um, the measure was not justifiable without having to say what exactly went wrong in the background. So this is something that uh, judges uh, can bracket, but if we want to understand how proportionality uh, is connected to actual uh, pathologies of the political process, it is useful, I think, uh, to come up with a typology uh, of pathologies uh, along the lines that I have tried to. Now, I don't want to say that this list is a conclusive list. It is obviously not. There are going to be many cases where proportionality analysis uh, works its way uh, and, and, and will lead to a measure to be declared unconstitutional um, that have nothing to do with any of these four pathologies, but may have something to do with other things. So this is not a conclusive list, but I do think uh, this, this typology provides at least a first uh, entry into thinking um, about the kind of things uh, that can go wrong uh, in ordinary democratic processes and to, to get an overall more sophisticated uh, picture uh, of uh, how proportionality functions and what its political functions are in actual practice. Thank you very much. That was all for my presentation today. Thank you very much, Professor Kum, for your ideas and for allowing us uh, to ask you some questions from the audience because people are very interested in what you presented. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask three questions. It is going to be a block of three questions. You answer, you organize the questions as you wish. And then this is how we are going to proceed. Okay, the first block of questions are more general questions about the methodology. So they are asking if you can say something about the link of the test to different constitutional regimens. If the proportionality test works, even in situations in which there are we don't have certain characteristics. Let's say it's not clear that there's a democratic system or a democratic state where the separation between powers is not clear and the rule of law is precarious. In a situation like that, can the proportionality test work? So what happens in situations where pathologies, as you call them, are not the exception, but rather the rule? And in this sense, can you say something about 
the institutional transplant, I mean, uh, methodologies that are born under certain circumstances and are transferred to different institutional arrangements. The second question for you with respect to this is, what do you think is the relationship between the use of the test and the result of the test? If a judge very obediently applies the test proportionality, the proportionality test to a constitutional issue, let's say a clash between two rights or the assessment of certain law, the result of that test is a correct uh, decision or do we need other type of assessments like substantive justice or other type of analysis to determine that the decision was correct? And finally, other people say that you emphasize that the test is not a legalistic or a narrow methodology. So they are asking you to say something about the links with other types of methodologies of constitutional interpretation. Talking about the hardcore of rights, if there are other methods of interpretation, and if you think that the proportionality test is the way to solve constitutional issues. That's the first block of questions. Thank you very much. That's a pretty heavy load uh, uh, right at the beginning. Um, let me uh, go to the first point. Uh, the question uh, whether uh, or how one should think about proportionality uh, in a context not of a well-established generally, generally well-working um, uh, democracy, uh, but uh, in states that are burdened by more unfavorable uh, circumstances, um, where the pathologies that uh, I mentioned, or other pathologies, uh, are uh, not just something that happens here and there, uh, but is a more persistent pattern uh, just become his ordinary standard practice. Um, I think my answer to that is that the institutionalization of meaningful constitutional review of acts of public authorities depends on certain prerequisitions. Um, uh, um, I, I, I think there is a... Um, I think these institutions are likely uh, to find it difficult uh, to play, a, a success, successfully play a constructive role um, uh, under highly, generally, under, uh, it may be difficult for them to institutionally operate successfully. Uh, under uh, under circumstances, for example, where whatever they say will be disregarded, or where um, uh, if they say something that goes up against the interests of the powerful, the institution will be challenged. So either the judges, new judges will be appointed, the ones who exist will be kicked out or will be threatened, uh, or uh, the jurisdiction of the court uh, will be restricted. There are all kinds of ways in which politically you can respond uh, to a court that is not doing something that perhaps the majority would like them to do. So if you're in that type of situation, I think the chances for in the long term for successful uh, functioning of a constitutional court may be limited. Um, but whatever the answer there may be, these are complicated questions about the preconditions for the successful institutionalization of judicial review. But whatever the answer there may be, um, I do not think there is a special problem uh, relating to the particular methodology uh, of uh, proportionality. Uh, so my claim is uh, 
that wherever the circumstances are such uh, that we can expect courts to play a constructive role uh, exercising judicial review, um, if we have such circumstances, um, then the circumstances are sufficient for courts to also apply the proportionality test when analyzing rights. Uh, so in that sense, I think there is no special problem uh, with uh, proportionality. Um, so that is not obvious. And I, I understand that one can have a, we can enter into discussion. Um, uh, maybe there are some ideas, more concrete ideas that some may have that are critical of that position. But just to clarify, that is my position. So I don't think there are special problems relating to this methodology um, that would not exist with other methodologies um, uh, when it comes to difficult circumstances. So that's, the, that's an answer to the first question. The second question was one about the relationship between the use of the test and its result. So if a court uses this test, uh, is it likely to lead to good results? Uh, or is the fact that they've used the test already uh, maybe proof or at least strong indication, does it carry with it a presumption um, that courts uh, got the result right? And I think there the answer is um, no. Um, uh, we can't assume just because a court claims to apply proportionality it, and, and actually you know, does the test that it does it well, that it does it correctly. Um, uh, that's a different question. We can hope uh, and um, the judges are well trained and disposed to really do the work uh, that proportionality requires of them. And if they do it well, uh, then the results are likely uh, to be good ones in the sense of justified results, legally justified results. But whether that's the case or not, uh, depends on whether or not they are good uh, at applying uh, what the test demands. And to understand what is required of judges, it's important to understand that this is not a mechanical test. This is not simple to apply. It's a tough test uh, to apply. It requires work to be done. But it's the kind of work that judges are well positioned to do if they do their work well. And think about, for example, the balancing problem of much of the discussion and proportionality is about the openness and a whole range of questions uh, connected to the balancing issue. And I don't want to go into the theoretical questions that arise there, but uh, the core point on a practical level is it is a test which requires judges to carefully think about what exactly the burdens are, the costs are uh, of the measures taken by the government. They have to think about it and lay them out and really reflect on uh, their significance. And on the other hand, they have to reflect on and lay out in detail how and why exactly this, and then with, to what extent exactly this measure furthers a legitimate purpose. So they have to kind of lay out uh, and critically assess both of these kinds of issues. Um, and irrespective of what your ultimate view is uh, on whether these, uh, on whether balancing in the end, there's only one right answer, it can be rationally done, it's determined, it's determined or not. I think if judges do the job well, then they go quite some way uh, to avoid at least the most stupid mistakes judge can, judges can make and are likely to come to an answer which is at the very least uh, a reasonable one. Um, uh, maybe not the only answer possible, but a reasonable one. But that depends on them doing the work well. I, I, there are many examples in practice uh, of judges using this test mechanically. Um, uh, and just thinking that there are formulas which you can just apply in a simple and formalistic uh, way. Um, and that's a pathology. So we can have a typology of, so if we have a pathology of the political process, 
we can also come up with a typology of um, pathologies in how proportionality can be applied badly. So judicial pathologies, if you like. Uh, and one of them uh, uh, would be to apply the test in a straight mechanical way, which doesn't understand that what this test requires judges to do is to really engage, engage um, the reasoning uh, and the and the and the and the the overall context in which these measures are taken and uh, the reasons that speak in its favor and the burdens that yeah. so it's it's basically it's a demanding it, it demands uh, something of the judges. Um, but, of, but it's not a demand, I think, which is utopian, uh, and it is a demand that judges are in a reasonable position to uh, fulfill, or so I claim. That, too, we can argue about. Uh, there, so there are, you know, there, there are all kinds of complications and issues about the judicial process uh, and working through proportionality that one can ask. But, but the short, my short, uh, already pretty long, but short answer uh, is... Um, uh, that the ju judicial branch is well placed to do a good job uh, at applying the proportionality test. And if they do that good job, then the likelihood that the answers they will get are going to be good ones is high. So that's, the, uh, that's that point. So the third question. So I said it's not legalistic, it's not narrow, then how does this compare to other approaches? Um, like, for example, uh, the Dworkinian one uh, that emphasizes the role of serious theoretical reflection uh, on the meaning of, on, on, of rights, for trying to come up, what does freedom of speech really mean? What is it, how should we understand it morally? What is the point and purpose of whatever the right uh, that you may be thinking about? What is that really? Um, and my answer is, that even though a rights discourse that makes use of proportionality is not typically focused on these types of uh, theoretical questions, uh, it is of course uh, in many ways open to their relevance in some cases and is open uh, to the possibility that it will become necessary for judges when they ask what is a legitimate purpose. When they ask whether on balance something is justified or not, they have to uh, engage the types of questions uh, sometimes uh, in hard cases um, that uh, Dworkin, Ronald Dworkin would describe as philosophical questions. Uh, so even though my, my, you know, in the beginning I confidently said judges don't have to be Herculean philosophers. And I think that's true. True, generally they don't, but there will be issues. It, it will happen. Uh, questions come up where it is inevitable that they will have to ask themselves these questions. But they have to ask these. They can ask and they will ask these questions as they think through the various, um, the, as they work themselves through uh, the proportionality test. So, in that sense, I think. Um, there is no either, there doesn't have to be an either. An, uh, so with regard to the, we, so with other words, you'd have to, if you ask me, how does proportionality relate to other methodologies? Uh, you have to be more specific and ask, well, which other methodologies do you have in mind? I now just explained the relationship between proportionality and say, Dworkinian interpretativism. Um, the, I know there are other techniques, um, the kind of the idea of the core of rights uh, as an alternative, um, or more generally, a more rule-based um, uh, um, uh, focus on rights jurisprudence, the strict scrutiny approach, say, um, uh, of the American context. Um, so in the, in the US context, balancing is generally, even though it exists at the margins, it's generally the courts try to avoid it. Um, uh, so we could say, so here I would simply ask uh, if there are questions to try to ask them more concretely and specifically. Um, 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 but my general tendency to the answer to these questions is uh, that none of those alternative, none of those um, 
alternative methodologies are in fact better alternatives, but there may be a way, a way in which aspects of these alternative methodologies uh, should be thought of as being integrated uh, into um, working out uh, the proportionality framework. So uh, I don't think there is a better alternative general methodology to proportionality, but it may well be that proportionality when it's worked through will have to be understood in a way that integrates elements uh, of other methodologies. Thank you very much, for Professor Kuhn. You were talking about the last step of the proportionality test. It's funny because when we organized this conversation, we thought that there would be many presentations about this, which was the most polemic one. And it turned out that it wasn't the case. And the majority of the discussion was about necessity. Several professors said we need to emphasize more on necessity and its complexity and some of the issues that can be uh, addressed with that like apply a mini proportionality test in the known sense. Well, that's a different issue. Well, I propose to have one round more of questions and then we can wrap up. I don't know if you agree with this. Good, yes. Very well. There's a group of people who say that there have been at least two presentations in this conversation that talk about the positivist formula of the proportionality test. And in general terms, this is a much more complex presentation, but what they say is that it's not necessary to incorporate moral issues or philosophical assessments when we have to address uh, this problem of clashes between fundamental rights. So they ask, what's your position about this? Do you know these proposals of positivist readings of the proportionality test? Now, continuing with this uh, line of thought, one of the persons who proposes uh, this positivist formula, they say that the end is not part of the test because if the end is in the constitution, making the analysis of the first step is redundant. That can be removed and we would only have three stages. This is for you. Well, they want you to give your opinion about these proposals. Specifically about the pathologies, they ask the following. If a constitution explicitly envisages unacceptable moral ends, but they are constitutional, how can a judge face this type of challenges? For example, if the constitution says that marriage is simply or must be mandatory between a man and a woman, and the end is the preservation of the family or any other thing, how can they face these challenges when the constitution says this is the norm? This, this uh, morally incorrect norm is the norm. Other ask about your position with respect to perfectionism, because you said that there can't be perfectionist or religious or virtuous ends in constitutions, but seemingly constitutions are full of this type of provisions. If we see, for example, the right to education, the right to health, in many aspects, the right to family, it seems that there are perfectionist ends that guide not only the, the constitutional design, but the implementation of laws and public policies. What does the state want with this type of provisions? So if there are liberal, acceptable perfectionist ends, or if 
they are perfectionist, those ends shouldn't be in the constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to the second pathology, you say, you mentioned uh, rights of freedom with this type of bands, etc. These people want to know how this would work with respect to social rights, because it seems that the principle of progressiveness gives a lot of leeway to always have a less costly alternative than the social right. And in cases such as COVID, in the emergency due to COVID, how can we think about these restrictions and these uh, disproportionate reactions of the authorities when they restrict social rights because they are costly? for example. Mm -hmm. And regarding the third pathology, a constant question that is coming up is why is it unjustifiable to privilege the interests of certain power group if some constitutions seem to be designed not only with that end, but it is possible to make an, an interpretation according to the constitution that systematically in, uh, favors certain economic interests. So with this group of questions, I invite you to answer us. So there's a, a lot on the table uh, again. Um, so I start with a um, question um, uh, relating to um, the positive nature uh, of uh, the proportionality test, uh, which um, the claim is um, somehow might not require the engagement uh, with um, issues of policy, moral considerations, um, um, et cetera. And actually this question, uh, the, you know, some of the other questions um, uh, were addressed sub specific aspects uh, of that more general claim by, for example, saying, what if the constitution specifically says that uh, X or Y is the case, then, you know, why, uh, you know, why would, why would it still be necessary for judges to engage in all kinds of complicated balancing or et cetera at exercises uh, when the positive constitution actually already kind of settles uh, the relevant um, uh, issue. Now, um, obviously there are some issues that a constitution may have settled. So for example, um, if it is the case uh, that a constitution says um, that uh, marriage is the union of a man and a woman, um, then we might find uh, such a settlement unjust and discriminatory uh, against uh, uh, gays. Uh, but it is a constitu positive constitutional norm. Um, and as such, uh, there are no issues of proportionality raised. Uh, there is simply a settled, constitutionally settled norm. I find that's basically correct. Uh, in that type of situation, the only follow-up questions we might ask as constitutional lawyers is whether um, this is a constitutional provision, uh, which is perhaps the result of a constitutional amendment, which itself might be unconstitutional. That's a question we might ask. Or if it's part of the original constitution, we might even ask whether the constituent power uh, had the power to enact such a norm um, uh, um, uh, as positive constitutional law or whether it is invalid ab initio. Now, I think the answer to both of these questions would be actually no, uh, this is something a constitutional legislature can do uh, and as unjust as it is, 
um, um, it's something that as a constitutional lawyer, speaking not as a political activist or a citizen who's engaged, et cetera, but as a constitutional lawyer, uh, that's the limit of the function. Uh, I think that's right. And this type of situation uh, with regard to this type of, um, it, it, uh, of, of norm, it may well be that the answer is there's nothing uh, that as a matter of positive law, uh, that proportionality and proportionality analysis, if you applied it to that norm, would show it to be disproportionate, presumably. But you don't get to play it, get to apply a proportionality test. Um, if the issue itself is not stated as an abstract right, um, saying, for example, if there is a norm that says, imagine, a, no, actually, no, I'll just finish this. So, it, so if, it, if we just have a norm that says uh, the marriage is the union between a man and a woman, then the issue, I think, in the end, um, is legally settled until that is amended. So the political struggle has to go towards the amending the constitution. Um, uh, unless you want to claim that this goes, this was an unamendable constitutional amendment, or this was not part of the original power uh, of those who gave the constitution to enact such a norm. And that, I think, uh, with, in this example, uh, would be an audacious claim. Um, so yes, there are restrictions by positive law, but they are more limited than you might think uh, in practice. Um, and so let me let me clear some misunderstandings uh, that might exist. So first, uh, imagine it doesn't say anything about uh, uh, the marriage being the union of a man and a woman. Say the provision just said the state protects um, the family um, and furthers um, and, and furthers a society uh, in which family unions fam fam the family flourishes. And then, um, uh, say, a legislature uh, that has established that uh, marriage is uh, a union between a man and a woman says that they were furthering the policies um, of um, ensuring that family life uh, can flourish. Uh, so they were fulfilling a constitutional um, purpose. Then, of course, the question is, well, is that actually true, though? Is the legislature doing that? Because where does it say in the Constitution that family life of the protection of the family means the protection of a family uh, defined as uh, the union uh, um, is based on a marriage and which, which is the union of a man and a woman? Uh, that becomes an interpretative question. Um, and I know uh, in many contexts where this has come up, I know the tendency is then to say, yes, but we know what the original understanding of those who enacted this norm at the time it was enacted was. And very often, if this is a somewhat older constitution that goes back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, then of course, during that time, everybody understood it to be a family to be based on marriage uh, between a man and a woman. That was the dominant, the dominant understanding. And basically no one, very few people, even those who campaigned as gay rights campaigners. Uh, and if you campaigned for gay rights in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, you would not campaign uh, for gay marriage. You would campaign for uh, against criminal provisions which prohibit you from living out your sexuality. Um, you would, um, and, and other forms of discrimination in society, but not with regard to marriage. That's an issue that only came up much later. Um, so from a historical uh, perspective, so if you interpret these types of norms historically, which is one of the legitimate canons of interpretation, then it seems to be clear uh, that even a constitution that is articulated neutrally uh, actually means uh, furthering a traditional idea of family. But that argument, this is the core, I, I think that argument is too quick. I don't believe, I think that's not a good uh, argument. Because um, if we connect the idea of human rights generally, and the idea of, con if we connect the idea of constitutionalism to the, to the protection of human rights, and if we connect the idea of human rights as requiring some kind of proportionality analysis, uh, 
then there is a strong argument to be made that if you want to interpret the constitution in light of its purpose systematically, um, there's a strong counter argument against the historical argument. And even though the historical argument may be clear and uh, straightforward, it may also be clear that when you think through the independent rights argument, uh, that a reading of an op of the, this constitution that would be incompatible with gay marriage is one uh, uh, which, because it would on its own be rights violative, is not to be chosen uh, if it is at all possible to avoid that interpretation. So there would be an argument to be made, ultimately grounded in proportionality and analysis of, of rights, this time as an interpretative argument uh, of a particular clause, uh, that it should not be interpreted in the historicist way, but to, should be interpreted in light of the foundational underlying principles um, uh, of uh, freedom and equality, uh, which are to, now this I'm assuming that this that these ideas are embodied uh, in some basic form in the constitution. If they are not, then we are dealing with some other document, which may be God knows what, um, but not identifiable really uh, as being part of um, the constitutional list universe. So, I, so here's so this invites another observation. If your conception of a constitution is a positivist one, uh, which says a constitution is anything that is characterized, that is a law that is characterized by certain formal features. And those formal features typically, if you say, follow Hans Kelsen in this regard. These two features are the norms claimed to be of the highest rank. They, have, they are at the top of the hierarchy of norms. And secondly, their amendment tends to be more difficult than ordinary legislation. Uh, requires either the constituent power to, uh, or some kind of a qualified majority or some kind of qualified majority plus referendum, something like more than an ordinary legislative process. These are the two formal characteristics, some people might say, uh, of the formal constitution. Uh, and that's all we can say about uh, generally about constitutions. The rest is a question of contingency, whatever it is that a legislator in a particular context has enacted. Um, I think that understanding of constitutionalism is fundamentally flawed. I don't. I think a, a formal conception of uh, the constitution doesn't get to uh, uh, even begin to understand constitutionalism as the normative project that it is, both historically and interpretatively with regard to the concrete practices. Um, constitutionalism, I claim, uh, should be understood as an enterprise uh, to implement an actual legal and political practice, the idea of free and equals governing themselves through law. That's the normative ideal stated very abstractly um, uh, underlying constitutionalism. And anything that cannot reasonably be interpreted to concretize, make real, that idea, uh, we have good reasons to be skeptical about and not to call constitutionalism at all. So I don't believe, for example, that it makes any sense uh, to say uh, that, for example, um, uh, um, Saudi Arabia uh, or Iran uh, has a constitution in the relevant sense, even if, in the case of Iran, that's the case, for example, even if they have a constitution that's something that's called a constitution and which has the formal characteristics uh, of a constitution in that it establishes highest ranking law that is more difficult to amend than other uh, than ordinary legislation is. So with other words, if you have a normative conception of constitutionalism and you interpret the existing constitution in its light, um, then you will see how many of those things that by some may be, may be thought of as positivist constraints and limitations uh, on proportionality turn out to have less weight maybe uh, than you may at first presume. 
That doesn't mean that there isn't something that the, uh, that the constitution can settle uh, that is unjust um, and uh, that is incompatible with, and that is not justifiable under the proportionality test. So I think the example of a constitution that spells out that marriage is only for men and a union of man and a woman is one example uh, of, uh, of such an, so that can happen. So, um, so the, Constit the idea of constitutionalism is perfectly compatible with the idea that injustice may be institutionalized in a limited way it, within a certain so so this is my, this is kind of the background understanding uh, which is I think important um, uh, to um, highlight um, so um, I don't think proportionality uh, can plausibly be understood as merely, merely uh, kind of a tool within a positivist understanding of the world of law. Um, it would be strange because proportionality is itself a test, um, which once somebody is authorized to apply that test, uh, that person who's whether a court or an administrator that's called upon to apply that test is required uh, even if in some constrained way uh, is, re is required to assess reasons uh, and make judgments uh, about um, how, what all things considered make sense, uh, is reasonable, is justifiable. So um, the moment you have some kind of authorization by anyone to apply the proportionality test, that authorization is one that uh, automatically is an authorization that goes beyond um, kind of uh, the idea of law as authoritative enactments that an, are then applied in some kind of uh, judicial um, uh, syllogistic reasoning. Um, so that's and the whole idea that law necessarily not only has rules in it, uh, but principles uh, in it is deeply connected um, to this principles, which in turn require proportionality analysis, is deeply connected with this non-positivistic understanding of constitutionalism. But to finally end um, on this, the fact when I say non-positivistic, that doesn't mean uh, that the, that positive enactments of constitution and are not central to this practice. Of course they are. But how we understand the positive how we understand the whole project of positively making decisions that are authoritative will be influenced uh, by our background understanding, normative background understanding, what it is that the whole project is about. And the moment we understand uh, constitutionalism as the project of making concrete and making possible and to settle disputes over uh, what it means to govern ourselves as free and equals, then our interpretative approach uh, will be uh, quite different uh, from the one that we might have if we have a formalist, a positivist, narrow conception uh, of the constitution. So I think um, I've answered, um, or I, I've, th this type of my answer will have answered a, a set of questions uh, that were closely related to one another. But however, there's one that I haven't answered that was on a different level. Uh, and that connect was about social rights, a more specific one. Um, so the claim was, um, how can proportionality work in particularly the necessary prong work um, when um, uh, social rights always cost money? Isn't there always going to be a less restrictive way, which uh, is there, isn't, isn't there always going to be um, um, the issue of, of, of costs, um, uh, which then raises the question of when you... Uh, now, now, I never quite, I don't quite under, understand uh, how the argument is supposed to go. Now, let's say we understood, and what exactly social rights and the realization of uh, social rights progressively might mean may, of course, in concrete circumstances be disputed. But let's say that generally speaking, um, uh, we might, uh, for example, um, uh, say that in a concrete context, uh, the right to housing uh, 
um, so avoiding homelessness, um, means that at the very least, uh, uh, people who are otherwise unable to fend for themselves and to, to be in a position to rent in the open market, they need to have um, access to what for them is affordable uh, housing. And now let's say for the, uh, you know, the state has recognized at least on a very general level, the problem and has, um, has invested a, a certain amount uh, in social housing, creating social housing. And uh, now a court is, is faced with a situation where an individual who's on a waiting list um, uh, and is being told that if they're lucky, then maybe in 20 years they have access to social housing. Uh, goes to court and says that's a violation of their right, uh, the social right to housing. Um, now, um, the government has already decided to address the social housing issues by building by building social affordability. There, there are all kinds of ways it might have decided to deal with the crisis. It could have created incentives on the market for cheap, for housing to be built more, so it would be more readily available, so the market uh, so that housing would become cheaper. It could have provided vouchers to individuals uh, that would enable them to pay the price uh, that the market demands. There are all kinds of ways social rights can be realized. But let's say this jurisdiction has decided to have a social housing project. This is the way they wanted to deal with it. That's how they dealt with it. Then, of course, a court can come in and say, uh, well, if this is the path that the government has chosen, it has to choose it in a way that is sufficiently responsive uh, to actually achieving um, uh, um, uh, the right to housing. And that is not the, whatever that may require, it's not the case when somebody who can otherwise not afford housing has to wait 20 years um, uh, for social housing. So the government has to massively expand um, the social housing uh, project. Let's say that's the, that might be, a, that might be. Uh, in some sense, this is not quite what happened in Grootboom in South Africa, but it's it's kind of a spin on uh, on the type of intervention that courts may uh, sometimes engage in. So they don't say anything; uh, they don't provide an immediate remedy for that person. Uh, they don't require the, the government to immediately provide housing to that person. They but they criticize, they declare as insufficient on constitutional grounds the actions the government is taking. It requires them to do more. Now, this costs money. Um, uh, this is expensive. But how does, you know, how in proportionality analysis does this come in? If you can show that you can address the issue, really provide effective housing to persons in a way that costs less money, then that's a serious argument to pursue that alternative path. Uh, it's just very often the case uh, that that won't be. Uh, possible, or at least it's not going to be obvious that there is an e equally effective uh, alternative. Remember, that's the test. It has to be equally effective alternative means. Uh, there's always not so. There's always an alternative means to do something cheaper. Uh, that's true. But the question is always: Is that equally effective? So I don't quite understand how the cost factor, the necessity test here, is a problem in the context. Uh, of social and economic rights. There are two possibilities, as I said, either there is an equally effective alternative means that is cheaper, then that's a good reason to pursue that alternative path. Uh, or uh, if there isn't, uh, then, uh, then the government is required to pursue the more expensive uh, path if rights, uh, if the fulfillment of that right uh, requires it under the circumstances. Final issue that wasn't captured by my first um, uh, elaborate response uh, concerns the perfectionist uh, uh, point. And the claim was um, that uh, even in liberal, so we, let's assume we're talking about liberal democracies, we're not talking about theocracies like in Iran or, let's, uh, or, um, uh, or a communist constitution that such as the Chinese, uh, where virtue ethics um, uh, plays a is uh, plays a central role. So their idea of, for example, of they have, they have this this quite remarkable um, um, system of social evaluation of behavior um, uh, that gives each citizen an overall score uh, how virtuous they are as citizens. Uh, 
uh, depending on, uh, uh, it's a very complex algorithm that takes into account all kinds of behaviors. For example, how often you visited your parents, uh, if you're uh, of a certain age, how often you visited your old parents, um, whether you, for example, as a man, when you buy, when you go into a shop and you buy, um, uh, you buy, um, like what's, uh, you know, you buy pampers for your, for your baby child, that's a plus. If you go, um, if you go and spend time watching porn um, on, uh, on, your, uh, on your computer, that's a minus. Uh, so all of these behaviors get worked in. Uh, and the overall um, idea is to create an incentive for people to be virtuous, uh, to do the right thing, um, uh, according to the Communist Party's idea of what that means, of being a productive member of society and living the right kind of life as one should, as a member of this community that's both committed somehow you know, to some version of communism, but at the same time, somehow weirdly with Confucian ideals uh, of what it lives uh, to mean work, to live, live well. That's not a liberal society, nor is, of course, a theocracy such as in Iran. So let's say we, we're not looking at these societies. We're really looking at genuinely liberal societies. What's the role of perfectionism there? Well, one thing is clear is what it can't be. It can't be an account of how people, people should live their lives fundamentally with regard to their ultimate orientation, what makes life meaningful, uh, what they live for, um, uh, that's not something, um, um, so any kind of uh, justification, any kind of state measures that depends on its justification by saying, by it, it requires uh, as its justification that this is the right way of life and this other thing, uh, this is the right kind of religion, for example, whereas the other one is the wrong kind. That type of thing is not, not acceptable. It's, it's, it can't be a legitimate purpose in a liberal uh, democracy. Now, what about those other ideas, such as at least being educated, right? There's, a, um, there's not only a right to education in liberal societies, there's a duty uh, of parents to send, at least in some societies, uh, to send their kids to school. Um, uh, and even if they don't send them to school, there's a duty to have them schooled according to certain, and so that they fulfill certain kind of requirements. Isn't that a kind of liberal perfectionism? Um, in so an aspect of liberal perfectionism. If we try to educate citizens to make them good citizens, not in the Chinese way, it's not to tell them how often they should see their parents and uh, how much porn they should watch rather than buy diapers or this type of thing, uh, that would be illiberal to impose requirements uh, along that. But, you know, so that they go out and vote, that they take an interest in political affairs and become critically uh, critically reflective individuals that play a constructive role in the political process. Isn't that part of liberal virtue, a liberal democratic virtue? And the answer is, of course, yes, that's, those are the types of things that a society can um, address in a right sensitive way. Um, uh, so in some societies, and I think that this is not a problem, there is a duty to vote. Um, uh, in most countries, there isn't. Uh, it's a restriction of freedom, no question about that, that you're required to vote. Imagine you don't vote and you have to pay a fee, fine, if you don't vote. Um, but that exists in a number of jurisdictions, and I find that perfectly acceptable. It's justifiable, I think. Um, it, uh, it may not be necessary, it may not be the best policy, but it's certainly within the range of things um, that can be side, decided in a liberal constitutional democracy. But the reason why it can why it's, why it's the type of virtuous behavior that can be required is that it relates um, to um, the conditions of establishing justice among free and equals, um, which, is, uh, which is the overall project uh, that constitutionalism is connected to. It is not about creating a virtuous citizens beyond that, uh, defining what it means uh, beyond that. So it's always, this other regarding aspect of always, this is about becoming the type of citizen that can live up to their respective duties in their behavior towards others. Um, uh, as far as, as any plausible understanding of liberal justice may require. So the preconditions for that uh, can be, um, so the, being virtuous in that respect is something which at least in principle uh, 
uh, is subject to uh, public regulation. And I think the right to, the, the duty to educate your children uh, and maybe the duty to vote in some jurisdictions um, uh, is you don't, you don't just have rights, you may also have duties in some jurisdictions in that regard. And that is, I think, compatible uh, with a plausible understanding uh, of constitutionalism. So anti-perfectionism um, doesn't say that uh, any kind of duty legis uh, uh, virtue legislation is off limits, but it distinguishes between the virtues uh, of uh, a citizen in a liberal democracy. Uh, that's a very limited conception of virtue. It doesn't get to the depths of your existence. It just, you know, it just touches upon you as how you relate to others as a political creature living with others within a legal community. So it's a thinner, uh, a thinner understanding of virtue um, than a full-fledged one, uh, which, would in, would, which would concern itself with more ambitious aspects of uh, the virtuous life. Thank you very much, Professor Kuhn. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of your presentation. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas, your time, and for your comprehensive and generous answers. And to all the people who were with us this morning from our social media and the courts platforms, we thank you as well. And we'll see you back at 11 for the last table of this conversation. Professor Kuhn, once again, thank you very much. The thank Supreme you. Court of Justice and the Center of Constitutional Rights, you should feel at home. Please go back whenever you want. Thank you very much.